Oh boy, today's giveaway is exciting. It's the MAPS Super Bundle. This is like three or four programs. It's a lot of programs all in one, all for free for one of you. Here's how you can win. All you got to do is leave a comment the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment, though, because we have to pick it. Otherwise, you won't win anything. Also, subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. Do all those things, and you have a chance to get the MAPS Super Bundle. It's like a year of exercise workout programming. Also, big sale going on right now. Two programs are 50% off. MAPS Performance, train like an athlete, look like an athlete, and move like an athlete. And MAPS Aesthetic, bodybuilder-inspired workout program. Shape and sculpt your body, develop incredible symmetry, build your muscles. Both 50% off. Here's how you sign up. If you want MAPS Performance, go to mapsgreen.com. If you want MAPS Aesthetic, go to mapsblack.com. The 50% off code for both programs is FEB50 for that 50% off. All right, here comes the show. Look, the best exercise for your lagging body part is not the one that you're doing for it. How it's do you a, know that? That's a big deal. Huh? You know what it is, is that uh, we there are, here's a challenge with lagging body part. First of all, it's challenging because it's a body part that doesn't respond like the rest of your body. We all have that, right? Yeah. But the challenge is- Glutes are a very common one. They are, except for you. Your, yeah, your glutes well, respond I, exceptionally I'm well. I'm the exception. The problem is that we we have a lagging body part, and then we pick what's typically known as the best exercise for that lagging body part, and then we keep doing that exercise, and it's not working. And we're like, what's going on? Not realizing that there are muscle recruitment patterns, there are ways that muscles fire and connect- to many of these exercises, most of them being compound lifts. And so we keep doing them and we keep developing the wrong muscle groups. Like for example, I'll use an easy one, right? Let's say your chest is a body part that's lagging and you're like, well, bench press. Bench press is a great exercise for chest. And you keep benching and you keep benching, not realizing that you're benching a lot with your shoulders and triceps. And so those develop really well chest never really catches up, but because you're stubborn about it and doing the same exercise over and over again, nothing's working. It's like a mystery. Why the hell isn't my lagging body part responding? I think this is like a, a single topic episode because it's, I think it's more nuanced, right? I think there's a lot more things. There's a that, lot to it. Yeah. That could be potentially going on, right? I, I would agree that a majority of people, it's uh, a poor exercise selection. I also think just the uh, attention to it. One, one of the, the biggest things that I think made a difference in my lagging body parts was prioritizing it in the workout and in, and in the week, right? So like, for yeah. example, as a, as a young kid that was lifting, like when I would lift in the past, I would, and you know, because everybody is consistent and then we all have our moments where you fall off for a little bit. If I fell off and I returned, I always returned starting back up with the the muscle groups I loved, and it's favorite never one. Yeah, yeah, my favorite one, the, and the ones I'm stronger or more developed because you like to do that, and you'd never miss that one. But the ones that were lagging or that I hated to train, I never. And that when you've been lifting for a long time, that con that starts to compound. It makes a big difference. And simply going, okay, if I fall off for a week or or even a few days, and when I go back, you just I always start back, and I started doing that. Like so, even when you have like a let's say. Um, a four day break. You have like, let's say you have a routine where you're training four or five days a week consistently for a long time and you don't miss very long, but you just miss four days. You know, technically most people would probably just keep, pick up right where the routine is. I wouldn't, I would start back with my lagging body part. So anytime I gave myself a, a break longer than three days in a routine that I was following by going back and always starting the next the next day I lift again with the lagging yeah. body part as a focus, that really helped bring yeah, up no, that. Yeah, that. no, that's great. That's really good advice, you know, but some people do that. They do all the stuff. They do all the volume. They do the, priori the priorities in terms of training that body part first and all that stuff. And like, it's not working. Like, to, to, to be more clear, right? You can, you can squat, you can do a barbell squat and make it mostly about your quads. You could barbell squat and make it more about your glutes. You could bench press and make it more about your shoulders and triceps than your chest or vice versa. You can row and make it more about your biceps sure. and your forearms than your back and not realize it, right? Not realize it because that's the way you've been practicing that exercise for so long. And oftentimes what it requires, if you don't have a coach who can watch you and say, wait a minute, I know why your glutes aren't developing. Right. You're, this is, <clears throat> you're using all quad. 
you can't feel and see that yourself. Sometimes what you need to do is change the exercise. Let me do something else yeah. and really focus on feeling that muscle group, develop it a little bit, then go back to this other exercise. Oh my gosh, now all of a sudden I yeah, feel Yeah, sometimes working. you need to adjust things, like even your posture. Like you're not even yeah. good in alignment yet to be able to really uh, tap into that response from that muscle group that you're trying to uh, incorporate in that exercise. So if you go back and you look at the limitations of your range of motion and you know you might have to do some work to even – place yourself in proper position to then get it to respond. But uh, definitely taking the time to <clears throat> really slowly um, work and isolate that muscle group and get it to respond and then bring that over to the compound yeah. lift. Now, being idea. honest, Justin, have you ever even gave a shit about this before? Have you ever? <laughs> no, seriously. Like, I'm being very honest right now. Like, I, I, I know I you understand. It. I know you understand what needs to be done. Yeah, like, you you understand right? the science and yeah. stuff behind it, but... Have you ever cared enough to to put that much emphasis on a lagging bar? Have you have you ever looked at yourself and go like, oh, I need to bring this up, and so I'm going to shape my programming around that, or do you just kind of chalk it up as I don't give a fuck? Yeah, Seriously. yeah. I mean, it's a fair question. I I'm definitely more movement focused in the broad scale of it, but um, if if I do see my myself and and I and I do some checkups in terms of like. Like I know that my chest hasn't got worked in in quite a bit, and so I'll put some emphasis there. For like, really, to me, it's more of a scale of like my pull ups like are really hard, and that and that right. pisses me oh, off, and so I'll go in that direction. Or, you know, it's really a more of a like what I'm not touching in terms of like um, what I'm not incorporating in my programming because all whether you do it or not, you do fall into patterns of what your sure. strengths are, right? Sure. And so mm -hmm. I try to challenge myself to see like where the um, the areas I haven't been focusing on, but in terms of like something that's not responding, like I would, I would probably look at it differently more like, no, um, you said it perfectly. You, you are more performance bit. You yeah. look at it and go like, Oh, I'm not very strong here. Yeah. I need to address I'm weak these things. There. Like that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I got to yeah. focus on, yeah, that. I got to do more pulling or I, gotta right. do more or I notice that I'm losing some of my shoulder mobility. So all exactly. of a sudden you incorporate yeah. more stuff like that. So it's you know, interesting. You I know? used to do this thing where, um, at some point I was like a great, to be honest, a sales tool. And I would have a potential client come in and if they were relatively, you know, kind of sharp and, uh, and I could explain things to them in a particular way, I used to do this example where I'd say, okay, you have forward shoulder, which is like 90% of anybody that I, I would meet that didn't work out, especially here in Silicon Valley, everybody working on the desk, right? And forward shoulder is exactly how it sounds, right? Shoulders come forward. And I'd say a good exercise to correct that is uh, a cable row, right? So I would sit down and I'd show them the cable row and I'd show them like what we're going to do is we're going to focus on pulling the shoulders down and back, work on what's called scapular retraction, strengthen the muscles that hold the shoulders back. Once those get stronger, you'll have better posture and I would, I would explain all the benefits. Then I'd sit them down, I'd have them do the cable row and I'd put them in good position, have them do it right and they'd be like, oh my God, that feels really good. Then I'd take my hands off of them and I'd say do six more reps and we're talking lightweight, this is a lightweight. And then their form would slowly start to change and go back to their old recruitment pattern. Then I'd stop them and say, hold on, let me fix your form again. And I put them in position. They go, oh my God, I didn't even notice that my shoulders started doing that. I said, okay, although the cable row is an excellent exercise to correct uh, forward shoulder, you can still do a cable row in a way that makes forward shoulder wrong. And because you don't necessarily feel that yet, I'm going to be here correcting your form, making sure that you pull those shoulders back. But if I wasn't here, eventually what you would end up doing is pulling with this forward shoulder position, not really, and I'm exaggerating it, but it would be more yeah. like that. You would actually strengthen the forward shoulder. And so then here you are working out you know, for six months. You're like, I'm doing this exercise to fix my posture. It's not working. My neck still hurts. What's going on? Yeah. And it's like, you're not, you're not doing this in a way to achieve the particular result you're looking for. And this is what happens with a lot of lagging body parts. People press, pull, squat, whatever, in a particular way to where that lagging body part is playing a secondary role. Yeah, well, you fall to your default patterns. And I yeah. think it's really like if you were to, if you don't have a coach, a coach is the best way to do this, to get that external feedback. But if you video yourself mm -hmm. and you're objective about your form and your posture, it'll, it'll do wonders for you. Uh, if you if you are in that position where your where your muscle isn't responding properly, yeah, totally. Hey, I got to tell you guys a funny story. Hmm. So I have a buddy who's an investment uh, uh, investment banker or uh, like a stockbroker, super smart guy, really cool, into exercise, so he's into working out. And um, we were talking about nutrition, and he always struggles with getting like really lean. Now he's done a good job; he's lost a certain amount of body fat, very consistent. He also kickboxes; he does some weights. 
he's like, man, I just can't get like to the point where I can see my abs or whatever. So we're talking about diet and like all the challenges with it. And I'm like, what's your, like, what are, what are your most challenging foods? Right. And he's a, I mean, he's a 40 year old guy. So this was hilarious. He's like cereal. I'm like what? He goes, yeah, dude, he goes, I have cereal in the house, Captain Crunch or, you know, pops or whatever. And he goes, and I just go to town with it. And I'm like, well, have you thought about not buying it? He goes, I do. He goes, but then I love it. And I got this weird relationship with it. So of course I'm like, dude, come to the studio. In our back room, we have all this Magic Spoon cereal that we work with. It's a company and, you know, high protein, low sugar cereal, whatever. Yeah. I'm like, come to the studio. Let me give it to you. He's like, no way, dude. He goes, high protein, like no sugar cereal. It's going to taste like <laughs> crap. Like, trust me. It does sound like it would taste Bro, horrible, yeah. right? I'm like, trust me, dude. Let me give you a box. If you like it, I want you, you can come back and I'll hook you up with more or whatever. Anyway, I gave him a box. Dude, I get a text from this guy. First of all, I wake up in the morning. I see this text. It's midnight. <laughs> he texts me at midnight. And he's like, bro. And he obviously is eating Magic Spoon at midnight. Yeah. He's like, bro, I just ate the whole box. I'm like, okay, well, you might be doing this wrong. As if at least you got a lot of protein. He's like, what do they put in this stuff? I'm like, it's it's really good. So anyway, uh, he came back the next day. I hooked him up with a, a bunch of new boxes. But it's hilarious. He's super sold on Magic Spoon. I did have to explain to him, though, that if you eat a box of it, you're probably not going to get lean still. You're just eating way too much. I mean, it's still not that crazy. I actually just got into it with my my cousin who was talking about it, and he's like, dude, this is, it's so overly priced. I'm like, dude, if I hear that one more time from like somebody in my audience who says that, I'm gonna, and it's my family, I said, you should know better. I'm going to strangle you. It's so funny to me when people... They look at that and they instantly go, they compare it to regular cereal and they go, oh my God, regular cereal is like literally a couple bucks per box. This stuff is five times the price. Yeah. And it has five times the protein and that's what you're paying for. Anytime something is really expensive when it comes to food, one of the number one reasons why it is more money than another meal. They actually food, put what they say they're going to well, put protein. Protein. Expensive. Yeah. Protein's expensive. Yeah, it is And expensive. so you, you have to look at that. It's the same hustle and scam that people used to do with the protein powders. Mm. They used to have to deal with this all the time with clients. I would tell them, I want you to get this, do this, and like I'd have the brands that I wanted them to work yeah. with back then. Yeah, and then they and, like they, the and then the client comes back yeah. and they would be like, uh, and I'd be looking at what they what they're using, and I'm like, "Why did you get that protein powder? I told you to get this one. Oh my god, it was so expensive. I found this one, yeah, fifteen dollars for five pounds. Yeah, and it was so <laughs> much cheaper. It's all I go, spiked with amino then I, well, then I have to turn it around. Yeah, forget that too. By the yeah. way, which is you know, if it's an off brand like that, there's a chance that's happening. But I'm like, do the math. If you look at the servings and what we're the reason why I make you eat this is for the protein. I'm not. I'm not telling people to have Magic Spoon cereal because you just, I just want you to eat Magic Spoon cereal. It's I'm trying to help you get a higher protein intake in your diet. Yes. And in breakfast foods, there's very little meals that have lots of protein. Yeah. So you have to look at it like that and then look at like, okay, if you look at a protein powder label that the protein's only $20 and I'm trying to get you to buy the 71, but then when you look at the serving size and the amount of protein, it's like 13 grams per serving where this one's like 50 grams of serving. So if you divide that by the entire bottle, it's like splitting hair difference of the price. And so people get that way sometimes when they look at Magic Spoon, they instantly go, oh my God, that's so overpriced cereal. It's like, okay, yeah, if you're comparing it to carb-loaded sugar cereal, which it's really easy to b bump calories through carbohydrates and sugar than it is to actually do that fruit protein. Carbohydrates, especially grains like corn and wheat, are very inexpensive. We've done a great job of making those ex yeah. inexpensive. We grow lots of them. Subsidizing it all. GMOs allow us to spray the shit out of them with pesticides so we can just make it really cheap. They're also subsidized. Sugar often comes from corn, so high fructose corn syrup, super cheap. Protein is not cheap. So you could very easily make a processed, heavily processed carbohydrate-based, especially corn or wheat-based food with sugar and whatever, make it taste good. Even add some cheap fats to it. It's cheap. Mm -hmm. Throw some protein in there, especially whey protein. It's going to be way more. And expensive. that's comparing it to powders. I just compare it to meals. I go, okay, you're, you know, serving and a half to two servings of magic spoon. Let's do the math on what the dollar amount that is. Tell me where you're going to go buy a meal that has that much protein. For that oh, price. Wait. Yeah. For that price. 
-hmm. You're not going to find it. You're going to pay that or more, if you, especially if you eat out. Now, okay, if you buy your meat in bulk and then you get up and you have eggs and meat for yeah. breakfast, like, yeah, okay, you can save a little bit of money, but we're not, I'm not, I'd rather you do that than even yeah. have Magic Spoon. Yeah, Don't yeah. do that. Do If you're going to make, get up and have some ground beef and eggs and actually make a good balanced breakfast like that, like, I would rather you do that. But if you're going to do something quick and fast or order out or something like that. Or you want to eat Fruit Loops, but you don't want all the sugar. Yeah, it's yeah. like, God. I re you know, you remind me, when you said the, the serving size thing, I, you know when that first hit me? I'll never forget. So you guys remember that, like when weight gainers were like all the rage back in the mm, 90s and early 2000s? Nobody really takes weight gainers anymore. At least it's not a big part of the supplement market. But I've seen a few commercials, though, which uh, it's interesting to see. Like uh, They're talking, and they actually like included some women in it, too, of like them wanting to gain weight. Really? Yeah, I okay. thought that was interesting. Maybe it's going to come back around. Yeah, I think the, it's like the fitness it's slowly kind of going that direction. But, dude, in the, or in the late in the 90s, definitely in the 90s and in early 2000s, but definitely 90s, weight gainers were everything. Like It wasn't about pure – you wanted – you know, Mega Mass yeah. 2000, yes. Heavyweight Gainer 900, Lee, you know, Super Gainer. It was Cyto always Gainer, Mass, mass whatever, yeah. right? So as a kid, skinny kid, wanting to gain weight, I would buy weight gainers because I'm like, that's, you know, crash gain or they'd have crazy names. And I remember, um, I think Weeder, it was Weeder that had Mega Mass 2000. So that was, at the time, the biggest number. I would always look at the number. I'm like, I can get Twin Labs Gainer, which is 1,000. Or this one's two thousand. Why would I go with that? I'm going with two thousand. I want the strongest stuff, right? So yeah. I buy that. And yeah. the, the scoop comes and it's no, like dude. This. I didn't so, even piece it together yet. A fucking bucket. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't even piece it together. Sand bucket. So I had Bless Mega Mass two thousand, and yes, it came with this big ass scoop or whatever. And then Weeder came out with Mega Mass four thousand, and I'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. It's like six <laughs> minute abs. Yeah, six yeah. minute. Yeah, yeah. I came out with seven minute abs. Oh, yeah. You heard of this thing, the eight minute abs? Yeah, sure, 8-Minute Abs. Yeah, the uh, exercise video. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, this is going to blow that right out of the water. Listen to this. 7-Minute Abs. My favorite. So what about somebody comes out with 8-Minute Abs? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're not going to come out with 8-Minute Abs. Dude, so I, I saw this. I saw this in the back of uh, Flex Magazine or whatever. I'm like, Mega Mass 4,000. Oh, I got to get this, right? So saved up my money, went to the supplement store, Mega Mass 4000, and it came in what looked like a paint bucket, like a small paint bucket. <laughs> okay. So this was a thing, which made it even more impressive to be yeah. like, oh, dude, this, yeah. this is serious. Well, I'm, like, gonna, I'm, gonna get, I'm geared up. I'm yeah. going to get jacked. Right. Yeah. So I remember picking the bucket up, and then I saw the Mega Mass 2000, which no longer is interested. You know, I was never, never interested anymore. I'm like, oh, 2000, <laughs> that's for babies. Yeah. And then I remember I was kind of sitting there, and I like to study this stuff. Right. And so for whatever reason, I turned them around. Yeah. And I looked at the, I didn't look at the serving size. I just looked at the calories. And I'm like, oh, yeah, look, it's 4,000. Yeah. This one's whatever. And I'm like, wait a minute. This bucket's got eight servings? I'm like, wait, is that right? Eight yeah. servings in this whole bucket? Yeah. And I looked at the serving size, like the weight. I'm like, it's double Mega Mass 2000. I'm like, these motherfuckers, they just doubled the size and called it Mega Mass 4000. Now, I still bought it because I was a kid and I wanted to, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. But I remember throwing that in the blender and it was this huge, sh so it was a bucket like with like clumps, 10 Like all chalky. Combo. I turned, <laughs> yes. Yeah. You turn on the, the, the blender and my mom has, she's got the heavy duty, like, remember she makes sauce. Well, this is like she, pre, uh, pre Ninja and pre like uh, the big blender. Oh, I blew this out. Was like oh, they weren't the, powerful the old school, Yeah, then. the old school blenders Dude, would do I the, blew the, out her blender suffered. because in order to get 4,000 calories, I don't tell you this, you have to yeah. add whole milk. So you put oh, like what else did you add, dude? Because I added all kinds of stuff on top dude, of that. Peanut butter yeah. and raw oh, eggs. And yes, like yeah, everything. Dude. Yeah, and you turn it on. So you put the, Ovaltine. You <laughs> fill it up with hella milk. It's like a quart of milk. That's like yeah. fifteen hundred calories right there. Then you throw in the big ass goose and you throw in the stuff. Then you hit blend, and this is the sound it makes. Yep. And it doesn't even like you don't even see the whole thing spin. Oh, you just see this little quick, quicksand. Yeah, this little thing. And then you got to drink it, and I'd sit over the sink and like, <laughs> and then my mom's like, "You're gonna hurt yourself." Oh, no, I'm fine, mom. You know, yeah. Boo. yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was the whole deal with that kind of stuff, dude. Uh, so I've been trying to pay attention to like any kind of scientific discovery, breakthrough, whatever. I don't know. I just feel like everything's been accelerating on all levels of like technology, science, oh, you know, so. aliens, whatever. That. Right. So there's this study with like African uh, clawed. Uh, frogs, yes, and they. Uh, I'm like, Wait a minute, Afri African yeah. clawed frogs. Clawed frog. I, that's a name that they have. I guess they have claws, but um, 
really what they were studying was how to um, regenerate limbs, oh. which is like something I've always was curious about if we'd ever get to the point where we could actually figure that out. And like, I, I knew like at some point they're going to like mess with genetics and, and being able to kind of splice things and whatever. But this was more of a cocktail of, of like growth hormones and drugs, I guess. And so they put like this silicon cap over the, the limb and they have this like time release of these drugs that actually like over like 18 months have stimulated new growth and has actually worked. And it, it grew something that was similar, but not quite like perfect to the to the limb. Oh, that's kind of weird. It's really weird. You grow your hand back, but your thumbs extra long. Yeah, it's like all like uh, I don't know, like a flipper. Remember, or uh, remember Deadpool when he because uh, he's got regenerative abilities. <laughs> His right? little baby hand. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the only bad thing, dude. Yeah. I die. If that. you could regrow a limb, people are like, that would be cool, dude. There would be a long period of time there where you'd have this little baby limb. Right, out. you gotta give it. A adequate time. I mean, somebody though, that doesn't have up. a hand would probably still appreciate a baby of hand. Of course. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's be honest. Like, yeah. You know? Hey, there was this meme like I, I shared. I could have no hand or I could have a baby hand. It's like, oh, there's yeah. this, baby this, hand. this meme I shared where it's this man and woman, like they're about to kiss. It's like this really romantic picture. And it's like, oh, you know, the sunset's beautiful. And then if you look closely, it's just like a little baby hand holding her face. So you don't, you don't see it until you look closely. That's what it made me think about. Yeah, the, what, the other movie, I think it was, uh, uh, God, it, it was like the um, the one that makes fun of like horror movies. Oh, uh, okay. Like, it, you don't remember don't that be a friend. one? Uh, What's that? Scary movie. Scary movie. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. And he just keeps like rubbing people's faces. Yeah. With oh, tiny yeah, mixing yeah. the mashed potatoes. Yes. Yeah. Ugh, that's disgusting. <laughs> that's something right. creepy about I, that. Uh, I read a study, interesting study, where they, this was a, a drug uh, study they did on mice, where they came up with a drug that mimicked the effects of fasting on the mouse. So hmm. the, the benefits of fasting are kind of interesting, uh, mainly because they there, there seems to be some applications for cancer. Hmm. Fasting, I know Dr. Walter Longo did this, right, where he had people fast or do what's called a fasting mimic, mimicking diet where they ate very, very little, low protein, low carbohydrates, and very low calorie leading up to chemo. The chemo was more effective because they, they fasted and the chemo killed or harmed less healthy cells as a result because fasting causes healthy cells to, to hunker down and strengthen, whereas cancer cells seem to be right. – Pretty. Doesn't it have a neuro, neurogenic effect or neurogenesis? Well, here's what's weird: when when people fast, your organ—I don't know if you knew this—your organs shrink. Did you know mm -hmm. that? Your 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 yeah, liver. Everything sort of just compresses. It, well, they just they just sheds off old stuff, and then mm. when you refeed, everything kind of grows back, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, this drug does this, and the way it do, does it is it blocks the effects of arginine, which is a, an amino acid that's essential or needed for certain functions. So essentially, and here's where I get a little skeptical. It's a drug that starves your cells because it blocks certain amino acids from doing what they're doing. May not be a good idea. Yeah. That's what I always think. <laughs> <laughs> May not be a good yeah. idea. That's, a, that's how I always feel. Is there, new, there must be new news that's coming out right now on fasting because I've seen a lot of people posting about it. We got questions. We just answered a question recently about it. I saw Lane going hard on it again. So is there something right now that's in, in, in the community that's like coming out, like a, re, a new study or a new product that everyone's talking no, about? Because it feels doesn't it feel like fasting is being diet, talked about yeah. a little more right now than yeah, it was just a few months ago? I do feel like that. I think the big thing that we're going to see with fasting is uh, or is its effects on cancer. Did you guys mm. know? So I talked to my uncle. My uncle's a, uh, he's a certified Chinese herbalist, right? And I uh, years ago, five years ago or six years ago, I talked to him about uh, the studies on fasting and cancer. And he goes, oh, that's a that's Chinese medicine. One of the things they'll do for tumors is they'll starve the cancer by having you not eat. Yeah, and it shrinks the tumor. Which now, I think isn't is that isn't that a practice for a lot of things for them? Right, that, that, that fasting has been incorporated for not just cancer but for other issues too. Right, the first one of the first medical applications of uh, lifestyle change or whatever was the observation, and I forgot who did this. I want to say it was Hippocrates. I don't know. It's one one of the early I guess the founders of medicine or whatever found that that fasting prevented. They didn't call it seizures, but in children who had epilepsy, mm -hmm. they noticed when they didn't eat, the seizures would stop. And so they said that, oh, this is a great way to treat. And obviously, what was happening was, you know, we we know with through epilepsy, through many forms of epilepsy, that if you don't eat ketones, your body starts to use ketones, and for whatever reason, that prevents seizures. They didn't know that, so that was the one of the first like medical applications of a well, treatment. Did, was that wasn't that uh, didn't that come out from the Navy SEAL with what um, 
our our buddy did Dom did, Diago Sino. Yeah, didn't that is that where that research came out? Yeah, that's where he because they were he, they weren't even doing it for that right. They were trying to or they were trying to figure out why the divers were having uh, the seizures. Yeah, and then they decided to switch. What made him? Do you remember? That's what, what it was. So that it's, research. He know, or, yeah, he knows that because he it's old. This is old uh, old medicine, but uh, ketogenic diets and fasting helps with many forms of epilepsy, prevent seizures. And what he was saying was that when they were working with these seals, these Navy seals, they use what are called, I think, rebreathers. Yeah. So they go underwater and they can't have normal breathing apparatus because it makes a bunch of bubbles and basically lets the enemy know that you're there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it makes very little bubbles or no bubbles at all, but the oxygen concentration, it gets really high, I guess gets really high. And for some people that can cause seizures. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, how, how can we keep these guys underwater longer without that happening? And so then he he looked at ketogenic diets and it definitely helped, wow. which yeah, you know, which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah. All right, more cool science stuff. Um, you know, I talked, I brought up that that drug a while ago that increases dopamine. And one of the side effects was uh, that that men were able to have multiple orgasms. Oh that? yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, great anyway, side effect. Yeah. Anyway, I'm like, is there a natural way to do this? There is. There are supplements that increase dopamine in the brain significantly. L-dopa is one of them. El Dopa. That's a that's a supplement that's been around for a long time. They it's beneficial for certain neurological issues like Parkinson's because more dopamine helps, and it does raise dopamine. And so I, I read about it. It's been around for a long time. Some pre workouts include it, which kind of makes sense. I haven't tested it yet, but I think I'm going to try it out. Let you guys know. Now, what what's your thoughts on doing something? If you do something like that consistently, wouldn't it? Wouldn't the body start to probably produce it less because you're taking it? You're Probably. intaking it versus the body doing it, and so I, I would mean, imagine that you're. I would be worried you about would down that. regulate receptors, or right? Whatever. Yeah. I so would, I, maybe while you're taking it, cool, I get this great feeling, but now I have to take it forever to get that same type so of. So you're feeling. trying to like yeah you know, get pregnant or whatever, and like supplementing ahead of time to increase your loads. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, somebody has to say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? I think it would be. I think it would be like a short term thing. Yeah, right? it would like be. You fun, take yeah. it for like, you know, a couple months, and then probably have to go off. Because that's how most herbs yeah. at least work for me. Or you just want some. a really cool weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. do it for a week before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honey, we're gonna. You know, what are you taking? Don't worry about it. I'm getting <laughs> ready for getting it. ready for Cabo. Yeah, I'll see, I'll see that makes soon. me want. There's a company that's been coming after us for a while. Protocol. That at first glance, I kind of just blew them off. They send us some stuff. It's in the studio, so I'll, I'll have you take a look at it. I, I'm curious if maybe that's in it. Then so no, I, it's not. No, you already looked at it. I did what they what they. And I don't want. We don't want to obviously call them out or talk about what they are but they it, it, it they have compounds in there that improve blood flow and then one compound that has been shown in men to to improve erectile quality and libido i'm going to be honest with you though how do you measure erectile quality, quality? i you want to know what they do yeah i do they, this, is a, this is true first of all there's surveys so they'll ask people hey did you notice harder erections yes which is that is so yeah. I know. Unbelievably subjective. I mean, I come know. on. I know. I, I know. take a ruler and then it's... Yeah. <laughs> well, How many wet towels was, can you hang yeah. off your Forget side. that it had anything to do with maybe it's, the move that sound, she did really. or it's maybe the, the what she was wearing earlier that day or some shit. Like, uh, you know, uh, Why was your erectile quality so good on Sunday? Oh, that's when I was with my other girlfriend. Yeah. No, it's... it's uh, there's, and then they do studies where they actually put a device, like a ring that measures pressure around your penis. Okay. And then they'll measure the um, the force of the erection uh, when you're, you know, they'll, have, they'll show you like erotic film and stuff like what that. What a terrible yeah. way to to, wow. to make that leap, dude. That's uh, such a terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> come on. I mean, anybody or any guy has to know that, like, how that much, so many different factors can make that fluctuate. I I just you feel know, like that. Don't masturbate for two days in a row and then see the difference of that, yeah. or masturbate earlier that day and then have sex later on that night. Like, forget yeah. if you have the supplement or not. I guarantee that it'll be way less. I feel like. Could you imagine being in a study like that? Like the the scientists are like, <laughs> we're gonna put this ring around your your penis. And they're observing. They're like, "Ooh, quality." Yeah, yeah like I feel like yeah. I feel like some guys will get better erections. I feel like some other guys are not going to get any. Oh, people are watching me. Not at too much pressure. <laughs> yeah, and some dude, dudes will be like, "White coat syndrome." I'm it's so crazy that we could we we, we take a, some sort of a study like that and then make leaps in when correlations and then supplements to, to try and and that's what they, that's why the poor consumer man has to be. So careful when looking at stuff like that because it, I feel like that happens a lot in the supplement industry. Is that we take a study mm -hmm. like that that you know at first glance maybe that sounds good, but when you kind of do like quality, what does that mean? How would you measure quality? Oh, you measure it by that. Like, 
well, what? Don't I know that there's a lot of other things Venious. that can be played that? Like, how do they tease out all this? Oh, they didn't tease all that out, so it's like it could just be a complete yeah. crapshoot that that they got dude, that result. Dude, speaking of veininess, uh, so you guys heard about the green M M&M, and M or the M and M's? Oh yeah, they're yeah. gonna make it more more inclusive, right? Because I guess it's like a female sexy M M&M. and How do you? It's, they're just M and M's. I know. Yeah. So what? Sake. Okay. Yeah. Could, do you know how much did you look into that? Because I've I've actually seen all the short shit on it and all the memes and crap around it but i haven't dug enough into it to like joke. what's really happening it's, it's it's along those lines like oh you know the green m&m was the sexy one this kind of stereotypical like girl yeah, and like high heels or whatever yeah, yeah so to make it more inclusive and then there was this meme <laughs> that came out that made fun of it. it's like now that we've taken care of m&ms is someone get gonna get rid of the dick vein on snickers bars <laughs> That's that's super. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> it is just, like, yeah, dude. I was thinking about I mean, that. It's just stares visual at right you. away. Oh, <laughs> I know. I never thought of it that way. But. I never have either. Wow. You just what is that on a Snickers bar? I used to like Snickers. That's a, a, that's hilarious. It is a vein. Uh, what the fuck? Why is it so conscious eating that? You know what? I yeah, I, t I tell you what. There's uh, I got I, I did smile a little bit yesterday. I t I can't stand this cancel culture right now. But every once in a while, there's a win. You well, know, every once every once in a while, themselves. the queen of canceling gets canceled, oh. and then it's just you see what Whoopi Goldberg what happened suspended. to her suspended suspended for two weeks, and she had to she, come out. She and made apologize. a comment about the Holocaust, saying it, it was had nothing to do with racism and other stuff, and uh, so she got she got booted. Wow. Yeah, they they eat themselves. The whole culture eventually they start to turn on each other because nobody's ever perfect enough or whatever. I feel bad for her. I, like, I'll be honest, I don't like her. I think in, uh, that whole show. You I, feel I, bad for her. I feel bad for anybody that gets caught in those crosshairs. It's, I, think I it's don't. Ridiculous. She's part of the the people that promote those yeah. crosshairs. Yeah. I don't feel. I feel it's bad. I feel time, bad for other right? people. Yeah. I feel bad for people that are not pro all this cancel culture. But she is very pro cancel culture. Yeah. Culture. I mean, she is. She's that one of the people. Form of media. I mean, that's their job is to like you know point people out and like try and get rallied you know groups to, to go get them uh, you know removed from yeah. whatever they're doing i mean i don't look i don't like her i don't like how she communicates what she says i think she's obnoxious i think that show can be very obnoxious i watch it anyway because i i try to hear their wow. points of view and I stuff sometimes i, can't, I, I know, I know I'm, I, it's like a, it's like, through like a minute but um, it's just it's a it's a movement that's hurt that's killing itself and that's what she got. Yeah, what is it? I was off air talking to you guys a little bit about there's there's something that Jordan Peterson and I and I and I didn't have the words to put it together uh, the way he explains it, but this is one of his things that why he says like this is a, such a terrible road to go down because it, it, you just keep. You keep making more subcategories, subcategories, yeah. subca and it'll never end. No, yep. you go down this hole, and it'll it, just it'll just get disintegrates. It's, it's, like, it's about yeah. separation, not about uh, unity. And you can always separate more and more. So it's like, yeah. oh, I'm you know, uh, you know, I'm Hispanic and you're Hispanic, but wait a minute, you're a man yeah. and I'm a woman. Wait a minute. But you're a gay man. I'm a woman. What does that mean? Wait a minute. I'm I'm also handicapped. Yeah, yeah and you yeah. just keep going down this crazy uh, path, and it's um, it's self destructive. It totally is. Did you guys see that the Washington Redskins changed their name? Oh well, really? I mean, they did. for a while it was just the just Washington. Washington. That's what they which, got. No, they got rid of. So did they actually come up finally with the, the logo? The and commanders. The commanders. The yeah, commanders. I know. Somebody like zoomed in to this building, and then there was like the logo, the, the new logo there, and so that, that leaked. Does it, did they have an idea what the lo what's the logo look like? Well, it was just the name, so I didn't, they didn't see like because right now they changed the mascot. Big, it's or like anything? the big W now on uh, there, yeah. right? So it got rid of. The, I would the, imagine it would look like a maybe a Washington kind of character guy. What would Who that knows? be? Yeah, what's that look like? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. I, no idea. <laughs> I just uh, imagined it. I don't know, man. Commanders, it sounds a little white supremacist to me. Command man. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Should have been the Caucasian. Yeah, I know? feel like they're not going to get mad. <laughs> yeah, they got to they got to change it change it to something else. So I, I don't know, man. That's, oh, wow. That's not good. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. funny. Anyway, um so I was on the phone the other day with uh, one of our partners. I was talking to the the founders of Ned. Mm -hmm. Love them, by the way. Love them. Aren't you guys talking about potentially formulating something? Is that what you're doing? We were talking about uh, potential future formulation and you know what we would want to see in a cannabinoid based product I love the guys because they're super smart they they know their stuff they of course of course they deliver but I didn't know this so did you guys know they have a subscription service I knew they have but I I'm not signed up for it, so I don't know exactly how no how it I works. wasn't aware okay so I have some here okay so check this out so this is I remember when we first got this so this is Ned Nutri uh, nutritive herbal salt. It's okay. good, man. I've had okay. that. Well, when we first got this, I remember thinking, and I told them, I was honest with them. I, remember, I said, when we first got your salt, I thought, what the hell are you guys doing making salt? You guys do hemp oil products. Yeah. Like, what is this? 
And then I used it. And of course, we fight over this because it tastes so damn good. And there's yeah. so many, you know, whatever. It's got a lot of healthy things in it. Tastes really good. But I said, what is that? How's it going? Because it is really good, but it's kind of weird that you guys are going. And he says, well, th those are one of the products that we use for our subscription model. So when you subscribe, let's say you subscribe to a monthly, uh, you know, hemp oil to come yeah. every single month. Yeah. They throw free shit in there all the time. Oh. And you'll get free stuff like this or oh. other products that they make for the subscription model that you don't pay extra for. Oh, that's cool. Which makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm sure I, I'm sure it's you can get that for pretty cheap, right? Yeah. So they're, you're not going to get rich off of trying to probably sell a salt product like yeah. that. So unless you're selling it for a ridiculous well, price. It's the best. I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. No, it's, it's the best. Really good, dude. It's, it's got, so it has sea salt, dandelion greens, nettles, chives, dill, cilantro, parsley, lavage, green garlic, um, and it tastes- got I mean, a good seasoned salt. Flavor. Yeah, we fight over it. But, so uh, can you, are, are you allowed to share? I know that this is like the second or the third company now that you've had calls with yeah. our partners, and they're all interested in potentially doing a collaboration on a product, and they're wanting your input. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight on what it might be or what you're leaning towards or what they're leaning like? No, I can't because nothing's uh, been decided. There were some ideas thrown out. But I will say this, dude. I am living the dream right now for me. My dream has <laughs> always been yeah. to be able to talk about fitness, have good time with it, and to help make supplements. <laughs> I did not want to own a supplement company. Uh, I don't yeah. want to deal with that. But we work with companies that sell products that now want my input. I don't know input. a day you, that's gone by where you haven't brought your big old supplement bag. Let's with you not talk about my dysfunction. I'm just saying. But I'm like, they're asking me, they're like, hey, what do you think we should make? What kind of ingredients should we put in? And I'm just like, you want to talk about, uh, you know, quality of erection, man. I am excited when I hear this. Kind of <laughs> no, that's quality. I am like, I'm going to go ahead dude. and take your word for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trust me. Not gonna inspect I broke it. the ring. Let me just tell yeah, you. Yeah. No, but it's great. It's, it's very exciting that I feel like, uh, I know I feel honored to be asked these kind of questions and I'm excited to see what these companies come out with, but I have, I've met with a few of our, of our partners and the last one I just talked to was Ned. So I'm excited to see, you know, what, what comes out in the future. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Sweet. All right, everyone, go check out one of our favorite, longest-running sponsors, Organifi. They make plant-based supplements for athletic performance, body composition changes, and overall health. They have protein powders. They have a green juice, a red juice, a gold juice, and much more. We've been with them for a long time for a reason. We really like their products. They taste good, and they're healthy. Go check them out. Head over to mindpumppartners.com. Click on Organifi, and then use the code MINDPUMP for 20% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Ashley from Missouri. Hey, Ashley, how can we help you? Hi, guys. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much for taking my call. I've been following you guys for a little over three years, and I recommend you to everyone I know. And I'm actually a licensed therapist, and I refer you to some of my clients. So Welcome. first, just want to say thank you. Um, so quick backstory. I bought the mom bundle that you guys offer. Um, when I was about seven months pregnant, I ran anabolic two times. I absolutely love it. I ran it eight weeks postpartum just to kind of like get back into movement and then around eight months postpartum, um, and saw significant strength gains on all sorts of ways. I'm very excited to run it again. I also ran hit. Um, I loved it. It was very different for me because as you guys have referenced, I, for so many years did hit the wrong way. Um, and doing it your way was hard for me at first, but I loved it. Um, my question is anywhere maps anywhere was also in that program in that bundle that I got. And I have kind of paused on ever running that because I have access to pretty much all of the equipment I could want in our home gym. Um, and I just didn't know if running a body weight program would be beneficial, um, because I've never run something like that before, or if I should run something different because I have access to everything and save anywhere for when I don't have access to all that stuff. So just kind of wanted your guys's guidance on that. Yeah, love that's, it, love that's, it. A, that's a good question because a lot of people confuse equipment free workouts, uh, with it being like maybe a substitute, a cheap substitute for better workouts. In other words, it's like, you know, it's, it's instant coffee. It's not, it's not good, but it gets the job done type of deal. <laughs> That, that's not actually that's not the case. In fact, when we created Maps Anywhere, now we knew that the way we would market it and the way that people would want to give it a shot was specifically around the fact that it could be done anywhere. It's if you travel, if you don't have access to equipment. 
But when we wrote the program, we said specifically, look, let's create a, a workout program that stands on its own, that's effective like uh, you know programs that include equipment because what we're not okay. trying to do is just create a cheap substitute. Although it's used as a substitute, which is totally fine, it needs to stand on its own. And that's exactly what we did with Maps Anywhere. And just something interesting happened during the pandemic with Maps Anywhere in that lots of people – bought the program and ran it because they were forced to try to work out without equipment. And the feedback we got was uh, extraordinary. Everybody was like, oh my gosh, this it's a great workout by itself. I had trainers contact us and say, this is one of the best programmed workouts I've ever done. So it totally stands on its own. And the way I would use it is I would run it uh, like you would run any program. So you do MAPS Anabolic, then you could do MAPS Anywhere, then you could do MAPS Performance. And it's just, it's different. It's totally different. Lots of closed chain exercises. There's uh, isometrics involved. There's uh, different movements you're not going to find in other programs. And so you're going to get other benefits from MAPS Anywhere that you won't necessarily get from other programs. So my advice would be to uh, at least run it one time by itself. And then after that, I would use it as like a supplemental thing. I just And the reason why I would say that is because to kind of what Sal's point is, uh, and something that you said, which is you've never done it. The fact that you've never trained that way, uh, the fact that it's novel, I think you're going to get some great gains from. It. I think you're going to you're going to see things that you probably didn't expect and um, and get some great benefits from it. Um, and then after that, like maybe you just because personally, I don't use anywhere that often uh, because I love I love traditional weight training. I love to pick up a barbell and dumbbells and do machines. Like I just enjoy that more than I do body weight stuff. But I do recognize there's tremendous benefit to doing body weight exercises. So the way I do it is when one, I'm either short on time or I'm short on equipment in a hotel, yada, yada, yada. So that's how I would use it in the future. But I do think there's tremendous value in just running it uh, one time to see how you feel. I, I think you would actually probably really enjoy it. It's and we 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 built it to where you could scale it yeah. as far as the I was intensity. Just mention that in terms of the intensifier. Yeah, we so added. Yeah, it can get really hard. So we did it. The idea was, you know, could we write something that you know all levels of fitness could get good benefits from it? Even if I got an advanced lifter who's been lifting for a really long time, then all of a sudden they run anywhere. Could we write something that's body weight and band only and still give them great benefits? And the way we did that was by building in these uh, these intensifiers that you could do on the off days of your foundational days. And that gives you, as the consumer, uh, the ability to scale it up if you want. Like if you feel like, oh, this is a little easy, then you can pick exercises that are way more difficult. So I think, I think you'll find uh, you'll really enjoy it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I, and I, I had a feeling that's what you guys were going to say. I just kind of needed to hear it because I mean, as all of you have referenced and you know, some of you are, you're all dads, but newer parents, you know, and I think it's just a mom. I've like really put on some strength after having our baby. And I'm just like that fear of like losing it all, but maps anywhere. And I think it's shorter in terms of the other ones. It's only four weeks. So I think I have to get out of my head that like, you're not going to lose all of the strength that you got. And like you guys just said, it's totally different. So I'm hoping that I will see some benefit from it. So I appreciate that. Yeah. in a lot of different directions with this too, it'll benefit the whole. So when you go back to like traditional weight training, you're going to notice, you know, some of those, those things that maybe you weren't stabilizing quite as effectively as you were, uh, you know, after that program. So there'll be a lot of unintended benefits you'll see. Yeah. and, And keep in mind, you know, strength is a skill too. So if you stop barbell squatting and barbell deadlifting for four weeks, Will your, str- will, will your strength go down on the specific exercises? Possibly, because you're not mm-hmm. practicing the skill anymore. But that's okay, because usually what happens when you train differently, and especially when you're addressing parts of the body or, or planes of movement you don't normally address, is you might dip a little bit in, because of this lack of, of, of practicing a specific skill, but then you get back real quick, and then you surpass it. So you actually mm-hmm. start to break plateaus. So, you know... Like I said, when when the pandemic started, we had all these people following maps anywhere that normally wouldn't follow a program like that just because it's equipment free. And the one of the top comments was, "Oh my God, it's so effective!" And many people now run it uh, mm-hmm. on a, in a kind of intermittent basis, like every three mm-hmm. or four months, they'll throw it in there because they saw so many benefits. So I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Okay, awesome. And then after that, would you recommend anabolic again because? It again will be something different, or would you switch over to hit or something totally different after that? You, you can do anabolic again. Mass performance would be good too. Hit would be fine. I think any program 
uh, that's different would be totally fine afterwards. Okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for calling in. Thank you, guys. No Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. Yeah, when we, we knew that that would be one of our harder programs to sell. Totally. And, mm-hmm. you know, the irony is, of course, we had it. And it was the the least popular program specifically because of what she's talking about. Yeah, the feedback was always amazing. Then the pandemic hit; yeah. it became our top now selling. You took program. away the gym. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's like this is an option. It's a valid option. And then you go through it and you realize, oh wow, man, there's so much benefit to this. And I I got all these strength gains in different directions. It That's is the feedback it, we got. It's hard to believe that you could get great results like you can with equipment without yeah. equipment, but you can. So long as the program has to be is, planned out. Yes. Well, I think uh, what you said too is important that she ha- she goes in with the right mindset because what happens sometimes is people hear us say that, and then she goes back to anabolic and she goes to squat the first day and she's like, oh shit, I'm down 50 pounds from my previous. It's like, that's totally okay. Yeah, that happens. What I would predict will happen is she'll see a, a little bit of a step back on the big movements like the squat, the deadlift and overhead press. But then by the end of anabolic or whatever program she runs, I bet she hits PRs. Yeah. I bet she surpasses yep. She'll surpass where she currently is at right now. And, uh, and those benefits are going to be attributed from the work that she did in totally. anywhere. Our next caller is Nicole from California. Hey, Nicole, how can we help you? Hey, guys. Um, I really appreciate you guys, first of all, taking my call. Uh, I started listening to you guys about a year ago. And... I stayed for not only the fitness content, but you guys are just super entertaining. So I really appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, So I'll start with a little bit of background. About three years ago, I decided that I want to lose some body fat. So I started doing, you know, your typical like orange theory classes. And then I finally got into resistance training. And so that led me into a bikini competition, which I did about two years ago, which was literally right before COVID hit. So about two weeks later, COVID happened. Uh, so I find I found myself dealing with a lot of like binge and restricting type of eating and a little bit of like body dysmorphia. And so after fast forward a little bit after that, listening to you guys, I decided to bulk to speed up my metabolism because I was still eating pretty low calories. And so I was I when I did the bulk, I got up to maybe a little under 2000 calories and I had put on a lot of unwanted body fat. So I did that for a couple months and decided that I just felt really uncomfortable that I wanted to cut. And so about four months ago or so I decided to cut. And when I did that, I was starting from about 2000. So I didn't really have a lot of wiggle room and I went down to about 1700 at first and then slowly progressively went down. And for the last six weeks or so I've been around I would say anywhere from 1,200 to no more than 1,400 calories. And I've been doing consistent resistance training. So I've been doing your guys' uh, MAPS anabolic. And so I kind of feel like I'm stuck because I'm not seeing any more progress. And I don't want to add any more like cardio because I'm already doing about 15,000 steps a day. And I don't want to obviously cut my calories because it's already pretty low. So I'm just feel like my, so my question is, I'm pretty stuck at what I should do because I know I maybe should do another bulk or reverse diet, but I don't want to put on more body fat because I still want to lose about 15. Um, and so I just, where do I go from here? And um, should I stick with anabolic or try a different program? Yeah. Nicole, when you did your bikini competition, you said that was, I, I see you wrote up here, it was about two years ago. Do you, yeah. how long was your prep and do you know what you what your calories ended up with at the end uh, of that prep? Like what were you eating you know, right before the competition, how long did it, did it take you to get, I don't know, stage ready? Uh, yeah. So before I did a uh, competition, I was just like a regular client with my coach. I did, I was on a diet, um, just counting my macros. And so my prep, so I went straight from that into a prep. And in hindsight, I should have reversed out of that. But so I was doing the prep for maybe four months. I think my calories at the end of my prep were anywhere between like maybe 800 to 1,000 calories, maybe even lower. I was doing hours of cardio um, on top of resistance training six to seven days a week. And so that, and then coming out of that, I just, my metabolism was all over the place. And so um, they were, yeah, it was fairly low. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll go, we'll we'll give you some good news and some bad news. So I'll start (laughs) with the bad news first. Okay. Okay. 
you you right. you went from counting macros to a prep period, which was four months long, which really was just an extension of your diet. It just got more and more severe um, because you said you were counting calories to begin with. Then you added lots of cardio, lots of cardio, lots of exercise, um, and now you're dealing with kind of the, the the consequences of that. Okay, so that's the bad news. The good news is you can come out of it. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. There's some, you know, I, I remember talking to Jason Phillips about this. He's the, the founder of NCI Coaching. He deals a lot with people in this category. And he says, you know, he feels like the body, the central nervous system kind of has a memory. And you have to get your body to the point where it feels like it doesn't need to hold on to everything. So it might take longer than you think. And you're going to gain body fat, unfortunately, in the process. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck here uh, for a long time and it could potentially get worse. Now, how do we minimize the fat gain? We slow it down. It might take a while, but we go real slow. So a reverse diet for someone like you would look maybe something like this. Right now you're eating you know, 12 to 1,400 calories. I wouldn't increase your calories yet. I would just reduce your cardio and your steps. Start with that. Slowly cut it. Maybe cut it down by a quarter. See how everything works. When you feel comfortable, cut it down by another quarter to the point where you're not doing any deliberate cardiovascular activity, still eating 12 to 1400 calories. Then I would slowly raise your calories by maybe 100 a week at the most and watch what happens. But you're, you're probably still going to gain some body fat. Your body still needs to feel safe and comfortable. It may be a long process. I had a client that I did this with over a year. It took us over a year to kind of get her body out of what had happened. But at the end of that year, uh, man, things were working a lot differently. She she was you know eating eight to nine hundred calories more than she was before. She stopped her twice daily cardio sessions. We were only lifting weights three to four days a week, which is very different than what we had started with. So that's what we're kind of working with. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to kind of go through that process. Otherwise, you're gonna be stuck where you're at, and it's gonna be like this until you back out of it. And and you know I, I don't know which one's worse for you, right? Sticking where you're at now or moving out of it and maybe setting yourself up a little differently in the future. Yeah, I would want to dive in a little bit too on the the body dysmorphia and your experience when you gained weight. Um, did you happen to test your body fat during that time when you went on your bulk? Um, when I was doing the prep, I was maybe around 6%. After that, I never tested it. Um, I had a bad I didn't like the scale at all after I went on prep um, yeah. when I came off. So I saw I saw the scale increase and I knew it was going to happen. But in my head, um, I just didn't like the way that that felt. So I gained obviously some weight I needed to, but I didn't test my body fat after the prep or after the competition. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I did gain weight, but in my head it was too much, and so I kept trying to like slow it down, but I couldn't because I kept eating and then restricting. Uh, so I dealt with that cycle for a while. Yeah. So I, this is the tough part about, um, you know, this is like a situation where, you know, I wish you were a client of mine and we were talking the, through this. I literally was just talking to a client of mine about a similar thing. She wasn't in a bikini competitor, but she has these extremely high standards for what her, her body should look like. And she puts on, you know, two or three pounds uh, extra on her body. And she all of a sudden starts telling me how out of shape she is. And I said, you know, you're not, you're not out of shape. You're in incredible shape. Uh, I said, and you get to have glasses of wine here and there, and you get to go out to dinner and you don't do hours of cardio and you're able, and you're in your fifties and you can maintain this, this body. I said, a lot of this is in your head and you, the way you view yourself, and what I would, what I'm wondering is, you actually might have been on the right track when you decided to bump your calories, and you started to gain a little bit of weight. And the reason why I asked about the body fat percentage because this happens with some of my clients, they put let's say ten or fifteen pounds on. And they're, just, oh, they're maybe their their jeans are feeling a little tighter or whatever, and they start freaking out. But then I body fat test them, and of those ten to fifteen pounds. You know, 80% of it was muscle. And yeah, we put a couple pounds of body fat on there too along the way, but most of it was muscle, which means I'm moving you in the right direction towards speeding your metabolism off. And I would tell that client, like, 
hang tight. We're doing the right thing right now. I know this feels a little uncomfortable for you. I know you look at yourself in the mirror and go, oh, I don't like the way I look and I'm putting on too much weight, but you got to trust the process. We're going to lean out. We're going to come back the other direction. But right now I need us to speed our metabolism up because we're not in a healthy place for long term. And so you might have already kind of been on the right track. I wonder how much of that weight that you put on was actually as bad as you think it is and uh, and how much of that is just in your own head of thinking that you were just putting on too much weight. Yeah, the other thing too, Nicole, is sometimes I'll get a female client that's 12% body fat and she gained weight through a reverse you know diet and went up to 19% body fat and freaked out. 19 is healthy, 12% is not to maintain. You know what I mean? And we tend to have those standards. Let me ask you a question, Nicole. Do you think you could focus on purely on strength and performance, if you took your mind off of how you looked, forgot everything else, do you think you could just focus on getting stronger at the bench press, the deadlift, and the squat? Would, would that be a possibility? Uh, definitely. I think that, well, when I was doing the bulk last year, um, I felt myself getting stronger, uh, obviously, but I also saw myself, like, my clothes weren't fitting, I was gaining weight, but I did get rid of the scale because I didn't want to associate that with yeah. like how I felt. Um, so I did, I, I did like the way that I feel and I was lifting. Now I'm obviously not lifting so much in my head. I feel like I can do it, but my strength is just not there. Uh, so I would love to get back into focus on that. So currently I am doing anabolic. I don't know if you recommend me trying something else for that while I'm increasing my calories. Yeah. Let's put you on MAPS Powerlift. I was just going to say, I'm glad you yeah. went that way. Because I was yeah. saying, anabolic is mm -hmm. fine, totally fine. But I think Powerlift would be good for the mindset. It's pure it's all metrics. Yeah, 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 all you're thinking about is getting a stronger bench, getting a stronger deadlift. Getting a, yeah, so I love that suggestion. Yeah, try this. Try following MAPS Powerlift. And if you're able to for the next three months, just see how strong you could get in the major lifts. And like, Nicole, have, have some, or not, sorry, have some compassion for yourself too. Like know that if you are getting stronger in the gym, you're building muscle. And initially, if you put on a couple pounds of body fat along the way, it may feel new. It may feel uncomfortable. You may be comparing yourself to when you were shredded and lean. And you got to get out of that that space and kind of trust the process because it does take some time to speed this metabolism up. It's not going to be overnight. And we are going to put a little bit of, of body fat on along the way. But that's okay when we get you up to eating seven, 800 more calories than you're used to. And then we cut you back down four or 500 calories. Watch how fast that body fat goes. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. It's been that's a uh, I've been thinking about doing that maps uh, program. So I'm glad you guys suggested that. So thank you. Yeah, we'll send that mm -hmm. over to you. Follow it and just focus on getting stronger and feeding yourself uh, for at least the next three months. See if you could do that. I think at the end of it, you'll see some positive some positive uh, results. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, oh, it was I Nicole. Yeah, Doug was yeah, 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 yeah. scrolling Second up and down over there, and I thought he scrolled on somebody else's name when I looked at No, you got it right. You <laughs> got it. Yeah. I, I tell you what, I think, uh, I'm, I've said this before, I think stage presentation competitions are for the worst for most people. Yep. I mean, if you have any, any body image issues at all, you're going to get on stage and get judged by how you look with other people. And judges are very blunt. That's what they're supposed to do. They're going to tell you, oh, your glutes don't look good. Which, your back correct look me good. if I'm wrong, but it seems like the majority of people that, that sign up have yes. these underlying it, 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 it attracts the very people. It attracts those people. Yeah. Yes. They don't wanna, and I knew it right away. When I mean, she didn't track her body fat. She said it already. She was getting stronger. She was at 6% when she was competing. That's, that's beyond unhealthy. She yeah, was probably yeah. right on the right track. Yeah. She probably jumped all the way up to 12 or 14%, yeah. which is still lean as fuck, you mm -hmm. know, and got stronger and metabolism was going in the right direction, but freaked out, freaked yeah. out because still comparing herself to this, this shredded lean body that she once had yeah. when she was on stage, not realizing that she's probably healthier, stronger, and in a better position where, when, she, when she was increasing the calories. Yeah, you know, this yeah. reminds me of like when you, you guys, you know, back in the day with Michael Jackson, people would look at him and say, "Who? what doctor, what plastic surgeon continues mm -hmm. to do surgery on his face when he approaches them? Like wh what lack of integrity? Who isn't telling him, you're, this is a problem, we're doing too much. That's how I feel about these idiot coaches. You're training this lady, this girl. She's already dieting. She says, I want to do a show. Yeah, no problem. And you 
beat the crap out of her and have her eat, have her eat 800 calories a day. Uh, like, it's about the money, dude. Yeah, you mm-hmm. like it's about the money. it is not even that much money in it. Like, uh, how big well, of I mean, an for, idiot do you have to be? Yeah, but I mean, uh, trainers love it because it's you're committed to me for three to six months, depending on how long we do the prep for. What about that? And it's you project your own shit onto other people. Yeah, it's just no. absolutely terrible. I, I would mean, never coach someone that it's way. flooded. It's yeah. flooded with this. I mean, it was a, a, a obviously at the beginning, we used to talk about this all the time, right? When I was in the thick of all of it. Um, it was probably a, a conversation in every other podcast early on uh, when we first started the show. But yeah, no, it's I, it's more common than not. It, it's it would be yep. rare yep. I would run into a coach in that space that I was like, oh, he or she's telling giving really good advice. For the most part, it's shit advice, and it's to the wrong people. It's like the worst people. It's like the people that do not belong competing at all right now on many levels, not just body dysmorphia and understanding nutrition, not enough experience in, in lifting yet. It's like you take somebody who's been lifting for a year or less, haven't even put muscle maturity, doesn't have a physique they've built yet, and then throw them on an extreme diet to get on stage and com- and then compare themselves. And work to the crap out of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just yeah. like, dude, yeah. come I mean, on. This is the process. You, you sign up for one of these events. You hire a coach who doesn't understand health and really has probably their own uh, body image issues. Then you have to send them pictures, I don't know, every week about of you in your underwear looking at the camera, and then they're going to break your body down every week. Mm-hmm. And then on top of it, you're going to be competing amongst a bunch of people yeah. who have their own issues. And then you have a bunch of judges who are just going to be very blunt, and then you're going to put yourself on stage. Like, you want to talk about the perfect storm for right. creating problems. Like, I, whenever I I, I, I have yet... insecurities even further. Oh, I have yet to meet someone who's told me, hey, do you think I should compete? I have yet to meet someone and be like, yeah, it's a good idea yeah. for you. It's almost always... It's, it's like, the, it's always like uh, Hollywood of this fitness space. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just, for the most part, it's a fucking cesspool, dude. There's very, there's very few people that are doing it well, doing it right, and are thinking about... And by the way, it's a sport. It's impossible for it to be truly healthy. Most That's sports true. All sports healthy. are extreme, aren't right. they? Right. And mm-hmm. it was something that I, I used to talk to my audience about, my little audience that I had back when I was doing that. And it would be, okay, I did this as healthy as I could. Here we are heading into the final two weeks. I know and letting you know that this is not something anybody should go and do because it's not healthy. It's not ideal. But it, it attracts uh, the people that struggle with this the most. And I think it just perpetuates the problem. Totally. Our next caller is Jessica from Wisconsin. Hey, Jessica, how can we help you? Hi, guys. So great to meet you. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. And thanks for all you do in the fitness space. Um, uh, My question is around, I think you had a question about this a couple weeks ago, but around building power for boxing. So just a little bit of background. Um, I just turned 40 years old last month, um, and I have been training in boxing, um, mostly for fitness at first, but I hired a trainer and have been uh, practicing boxing for a couple years and actually am going to compete in my first uh, boxing bout in April. Hell yeah. Look at you. So really excited about that through our it's a charity event called white collar boxing so um i work with a, an amazing coach um on my skills i run four to five times a week for cardio for conditioning but i'd really like to be able to uh build up some power in my punches and would love to know what you'd recommend as far as a maps program or other uh programming for uh strength to kind of complement the rest of my training yeah so how, how many days a week are you are you training boxing specific right now uh, three to four, um, sometimes four to five, depending. Uh, it's usually pretty low key. We're just really working on footwork and um, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. But uh, yeah, we do uh, we do get lots of practice in. All right, and then do you spar? Are you sparring right now? Yeah, we spar one to two times a week. Oh, cool. Full headgear the whole deal, and you guys are hitting each other? Yeah, whole, full headgear. Although we are using 16-ounce gloves, so. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, once a week. Once a week of resistance training is going to be plenty. Yeah. Uh, MAPS performance. Yes, probably, performance, please. Yeah, that would be your best bet. I would do pick one foundational workout, because the program has got three foundational workouts a week. That's way too much for what you're doing. I would go one foundational workout a week. Pick Pick your choice, whichever one you want and go through mass performance. And then the mobility sessions, you could throw this, those in wherever. But once a week is going to be plenty with what you're currently doing. Any more, and you're probably going to overdo it and maybe even take away your ability to 
practice what's most important right now, which is your your boxing skill. Yeah, and I mean, generating more ground forces is something that uh, would I would recommend as a focus. Uh, and how you do that is um, really like connecting your entire body. So like connecting your hips, your legs involved with your upper body. So that's a big focus of driving, uh, you know, through from your foot to your hips snapping and getting that rotation, getting everything super connected and be able to, to – uh, drive as much force as possible, uh, you know, all the way up into, you know, your shoulder and your arm on release. So it's this whole fast, loose approach. So you have to, you have to kind of, it's, it's complicated, right? Because athletics, you're always dealing with like, um, you know, how much, how much force I can, I can create, uh, but then also control. And so, you know, there's the control aspect to it of being loose, but also being tight when you need to be tight and, and being able to generate, uh, you know, that muscle contraction to really like whip uh, that arm across and, and connect the arm with the hip. So, um, you know, there's stuff in, in MAPS performance you'll see with the stick where we do this, you know, laterally um, and we really drive it into the wall. And these types of exercises really help you to kind of focus that and channel that type of uh, power uh, from your hips. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, uh, when you get close to your, your actual match for at least the two weeks leading up to it, I wouldn't do any resistance training. So I, I wanted to say that. So you can do resistance training and about two weeks before you want to cut it out and focus entirely on what you're going to be doing uh, with your coach. And strength and muscle definitely play a role in power, but technique uh, and speed play a bigger role in power. So a much smaller guy can hit a lot harder than a bigger guy uh, just through technique and skill. I'm sure your coach, you probably, if you've asked your coach this, they'll tell you the same thing. They'll tell you, look, you know, you can be big, strong, but if you don't have the speed and the technique – you're going to lose all that power. So mm -hmm. it, it, most of it comes from there. So what you're going to get from the strength training is just more uh, security. Muscle recruitment. Yeah, more security in your joints. You're going to be a, There's going to be a protective element, maybe more stability. I noticed in your question you wrote down that you have some hypermobility in the shoulder and elbow, so it might you know, kind of help with that. So, But yeah, MAPS performance, that would be the perfect program. One foundational workout a week and just leave it at that. And then you can even go through the phases, You know, phase one, two, three, and – and four leading up to uh, your match. And again, two weeks before, I would stop all resistance training. Uh, I don't have much to contribute uh, to what, what the guys already said. I agree with everything they said, except for I would add, um, I would defer to some of the, our friends that are experts in this. If you're not following Tony, Tony Jeffries and Phil Daru, I think uh, they, they put out tremendous content that's completely centered around punching and fighting. So, oh, that's um, great. yeah, they're, they're far more knowledgeable than us. We've actually had both, both of them on the show before, so you can search them back if you want to listen to the episode, but they both, uh, put out a lot of good content on both Instagram and YouTube, both Phil Daru and then, uh, and then Tony Jeffries. So check out what they have, uh, have to offer. And then like the guy said, I, I think the one day a week foundational training from performance is great. And then the way I would dictate how much of the mobility sessions I do, it would, it would, uh, it would reflect how much work I'm putting in boxing that week. So let's say it's, I heard you say sometimes it's five or six days a week of boxing. So if it's an intense week of boxing, I may only do a mobility day or none, just the one foundational day. If you have like a lot of light work, like a lot of light footwork and like speed drills, but not nothing really intense, um, I might add two or three mobility sessions to that. So use the mobility sessions to complement your workload that you're doing because uh, you're not going to get huge gains from that. I think it's more about helping you recover and staying mobile and connected. So use that based off of your workload uh, that you're doing in boxing. Boxing comes first. One day of training as your foundational for weightlifting, and then mobility intermittently thrown in there based off of your load. That's great. And just a real quick follow up to that: as far as mobility work, should I be avoiding the mobility in my arms and shoulders? Because my right shoulder, you know, I've hyperextended it a couple times. I, I popped it out. It's actually uh, a real mm. fun story at the gym because I'm the only girl and. I didn't cry when it happened. Um, and, uh, you know, I've hyperextended my shoulder a couple of times. So uh, should I be avoiding that and not to keep it too mobile or should yeah, I more well, lean into that think, to make functional mobility? Yeah. Think of it less as a uh, range of motion increase and more of like gaining strength in that range of motion. So, you know, taking that incrementally and being able to generate uh, tension there. So like having an isometric focus where we're, we're kind of squeezing our way through it and just really gradually going through each checkpoint of each angle 
Um, so that way, you know, you're able to stabilize it properly. Yeah, so yeah, proper mobility work includes strengthening connecting. So that means it'll help your situation. So you're not doing like lots of stretches or just trying to move uh, through different ranges of motion without connecting. That would make things worse. You got to stay tense and connect through the mobility work. So remember that when you're when you're looking through the mobility a, sessions. A good example of that, have you seen, uh, Jessica, have you seen the, the MAPS Prime Pro webinar that I did um, that was free? Um, it's been a little while. I watched it uh, probably six months ago, so I need to go back. <laughs> okay, so do that. A good example of what the guys are saying right now is I think the second or third exercise I do is handcuff with rotation. Um, mm -hmm. And when you hear Justin one. and Sal talking about, you know, creating tension the entire time through the movement, watch how I do that movement and how I coach it. And all of your mobility work should reflect that. It should mm -hmm. have this kind of intense, slow, con staying connected type movement. Think of it less of like a stretch where you're trying to get a greater longer range of motion and like justin said you're being you're more connected through the whole range yeah, of yeah adam gives really good cues for that and i think if you take those cues and then you also apply it to the one i did for you know checking you know with our compass tests and prime it's it's just um it kind of goes through very specific ones for the shoulder that would be helpful as well but you do have to have that kind of intensity applied to to make sure it's it's you know w w the focus is right and by the way that's a great way to kind of prime the body before you go into any of your stuff so if you're getting ready to go throw punches if you're getting ready to do your workout you could prime uh with those movements heading into it and you're only going to be better connected throw better punches be stronger when you lift so those are movements that you can you can do uh, for recovery on days that you're not training, you could also do that as as priming stuff to get you ready before you start throwing punches. Awesome. That's great. I'm really excited. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I wasn't sure which direction to go. I have I have several of your programs, but I don't have performance. So really excited to dig in and uh, and get going with it. Cool. Thank you so much for your time. We'll send awesome. that to you. Yeah. Good luck. Best of luck to you. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. No problem. You too. Yeah, the whole um, like how to add resistance training to sp heavy, intense sport, you know, training, it's supplemental, right? Mm -hmm. When Definitely. strength training becomes the focus is when you're a strength athlete. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're a boxer, or a football player, a baseball or you're player, in the off or off season, or off season, yeah. devote it completely to that. But yes, 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 yes. Good point. Very, very good point. But, you know, she's focusing so much on boxing. She's amateur, she's new at this. That you know, one day a week, one day it's plenty. It's yeah. going to give you enough strength. It's do a lot. Yeah, going to give you some stability if you do it right and complement kind of what she's doing. Well, like you said, if if the strength training at all, even in the slightest way, impedes on her current boxing training, then it's only going to hurt her skills. Yep. You know, so and the better you are at throwing a punch, and the faster you are throwing a punch, the because KO right, she was looking for she wants to KO somebody, which is great, right? So <laughs> that's her goal. And so her speed and technique is going to play a much bigger role in that than her increasing her bench or deadlift or yep. shoulder press. Totally. Our next caller is Holly from Canada. Holly, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Hey. <laughs> um, okay, so if you, sorry, if you read my question, like I said, I feel like I'm super fit. I'm super, I feel really strong and good when I go into the gym. I work out with like good form. I have been running pretty much solely MAPS programs for the last four years. I've done aesthetics probably two or three times, split twice, power lift, strong, anabolic. But I just don't feel very like athletic. If I, for example, I recently started skiing again, and I just feel like so uncoordinated. And if I ever play sports with friends or something, I just don't feel like I can run fast or move in a really athletic way. And mm. I just don't know it's weird, uh, how to make myself be more of an athlete. If only we wrote a program yeah. that was specific to performance <laughs> yeah. athletes. I wonder which one you should follow. Where, where is that one? Like? Come on, Holly. <laughs> now, you know what? Holly, let me tell you. Sorry, I can't hear you guys at all. Uh, <laughs> can you hear us now? I can hear Sal a little bit, but when Adam talked, I couldn't hear anything. Oh, uh, wow. He doesn't say anything important. Yeah, don't listen to him anyways. <laughs> Uh, let me think Only here. Only the best what, advice of your life, that's what all. What could be the issue here? I am trying to uh, determine. We'll just let Sal yell it out. Yeah. yeah or Doug, why don't you answer this let's one? Let's roll with it. 
Yeah, Doug. We don't do that. <laughs> Doug's got this. Yeah. And so yeah, you've yeah, listed. Yeah, so I'll do it. Yeah, here's yeah. here's the deal. I I can't give you a long answer, but I can give you a very short and succinct answer. You mentioned a lot of different programs you've done. Have you done Maps Performance? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I have Maps Performance, and I've run it halfway through once, and then I started it again at the beginning of last month before the gyms in Ontario closed again, and. No hate on you guys' programs because obviously I love them, but I just personally find performance kind of boring for me, and I'm not really able to stick to it very well. Well, okay, so we're going to challenge your ego here. Yeah, I was going to say, well, you, you can't, you, you want to have your cake and eat it too, right? You, I don't like to train like an athlete either. I think that's boring. I like to train like a bodybuilder and look like a bodybuilder, but every once in a while I want to play basketball, and so it requires me doing the boring. Uh, multi-planar type of movements that I don't like doing, but it's going to translate mm-hmm. on the court better than anything else. So it's kind of like, okay, well, you you kind of know what you're supposed to be doing. You don't like doing it very much, but then you want the results from that uh, to translate onto the onto the field or whatever sport you're playing. So that is the program, and it's like specifically designed for someone just like you to perform yeah. better what, in their sport. If I might ask... Uh, you said you ran you ran it kind of almost halfway through. Like, what part was boring for you? Um, I mean, obviously the mobility session. <laughs> the mobility session, the one that's going to provide you with the most impact uh, for being <laughs> athletic. Okay, yeah, you know <laughs> what, sense. Holly? Yeah, let me, but let me jump in here real quick. Sorry, a lot of times people confuse uh, fitness with athletic ability. Now, fitness plays a role. In athletic ability, mm-hmm. but a big part of athletic ability is skill and coordination, which comes with practice. So I'll give you an alternative answer. Mm-hmm. I think BAPS Performance is the perfect program for you, but I do think if mm-hmm. you want to get better at certain sports, you should just practice those sm- those sports more often. Play more basketball, play more baseball, do more skiing, and you'll get better at those things. No amount of fitness in the gym is going to give you the type of coordination specific to the sport you're trying to get better at than practicing that sport itself. Now, so that being said, if you want to do something in the gym that's going to translate the most into sports... Mass performance. Mass performance. That program is written, and every part of it is written to specifically address all the things that an athlete needs, all the attributes that a general athlete, just like yourself, soccer, what do we say? Soccer, skiing, what's the other one that we got? Baseball. You know, that's why that program is so perfect. It's not just for basketball players and not just for, it's for somebody who wants general strength in all different directions, good mobility, flexibility, endurance, stamina, all the things that you want to be good in sports. Right. Yeah. and, and, Mm -hmm. And here's the other, look, here's the other side of it too. Athleticism can be quite specific. So just because somebody's really good with strength exercises and not good in a traditional sport doesn't mean they're not athletic. It just means they're not athletic for a particular sport. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe you just don't like it. You want something, but you don't like it. Who cares? You know, Be good in the gym, keep healthy, and you're totally fine. Mm-hmm. But if you still want that athletic ability, I mean, the advice is the same. MAPS performance in the gym – and I would practice those sports more often. And if you really don't want to do athletic training in the gym, you like traditional resistance training in the gym, still practice playing sports outside of the gym because that's going to give you more of that athleticism. This, but you this can't will, expect to get more athleticism without doing that. This hits home for me right now a lot. Okay, so I've been telling Katrina off air, just her and I talking, I say, I, I really want to get back into playing basketball. I miss playing the ball. It's one of my favorite pastimes to do that. Now, I know I'm in no condition to play basketball. Does that mean I'm, not, I'm strong? I can lift a lot of weight right now. I'm not in bad shape. I'm just not in basketball shape. And I know the exercises that I need to do to prepare myself to go play basketball. And even even like what Sal's saying, nothing's going to get me better playing basketball than playing basketball. But I do know there are specific exercises that I should do to prepare myself to get ready for that. And because I also don't like training that way. Maps Performance is one of my least favorite programs too because I like split and aesthetic and strong and more bodybuilder type focused programs. I won't let myself play basketball because I'm not doing the work I should do to prepare my body to go out there and perform. And I do that because I'm getting older and I know I'll hurt myself because my mind will say I can still play like I'm 20, but I know I can't. And so 
my sacrifice is, well, I don't I don't deserve to go play that sport right now because I'm not doing the work in the gym to prepare my body for that. And so it really comes down to asking yourself, Holly, what do you really want to do? Yeah. You know, I got a little bit of a compromise for you, Holly. What if you did one foundational workout a week from performance and then two foundational workouts a week from another MAPS program that's maybe something along the lines that you enjoy more, maybe like a MAPS anabolic or a MAPS aesthetic? So you're getting some of the athletic training, but then most of the week you or get to do the, the fun stuff. Run MAPS aesthetic and then do the mobility sessions in between instead of focus sessions. Yeah, you can mix it up that way. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask is like if there's a way to it, sort of incorporate performance into another program without having to fully do sure. performance since I've found like it hard to adhere Maybe to steps. it in the past. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you could you could totally do that. You could totally go one foundational workout a week from performance, two from aesthetic, or all from aesthetic and then do only mobility sessions. And you can kind of mix it that way, and the mix will determine what you get more of, you know, the aesthetic version, the types of results or the more of the athletic types of results. But I will say this, Holly, training for athleticism doesn't reduce your aesthetics. I, I, I think you might be, yeah, especially right. for someone who, if you've never trained that way, I think you might be surprised that mm -hmm. you may actually get, you might actually look Definitely. better because now you're doing things you're, you normally don't do. Yeah, right. All right. Well, well, thanks for calling in, Holly. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. No All problem. Right, thank you. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, math performance, yeah, I but I, you know, uh, I appreciate. Yeah. I appreciate that she was honest because yeah. here, I, literally, this is close to home for me right now. I'm not kidding that I've been wrestling with this idea of going mm -hmm. back to playing basketball so much in the last year. Like I really miss it. But I've had a couple times where I go out there to go try and play, and oh boy, my body is not ready. Yeah, I'm, I I can go deadlift or bench press right now, no problem. But I to go laterally move left or right really fast and explosive. Yeah. I'm Most scared. people in the gym, yeah, they're what they're they're not doing what's going to promote the, you know really good explosive movement. And right, that's, that takes the uh, actual work uh, that's very specific. So. You know, it, it may be challenging mentally to to do things that are outside your comfort, but you really, if you're really serious about becoming a better athlete or having more athleticism or just moving better in general, that has to be a focus. Well, that so this is the accountability piece that I'm having with myself. Like I, I won't go play ball unless I'm willing to put in the steps that I know are going to protect me from getting hurt. I know I'm not putting that work, and for some reason I'm having this hard time because I used to love that way of training as a kid. I just don't care. I don't like to now. And yeah. I know part of it is it's hard. Right. And I'm, I'm going to suck at it for a while. You know, I don't yep. feel like. And so, you know, she's in the same exact dilemma right here where I obviously the the program she listed off, she's she's definitely more focused on strength and look. Right. Well, she I mean, probably uh, feels good because she's looking good. Right. But, but yeah, it's just her movement probably. Yeah. Isn't and then great. I bet when she did like mate, the lunge matrix and did some of the single leg movements we have, there, she <laughs> probably had to go way lighter. Well, yeah. Which and, is a yeah, it's a total uh, yeah. attack on, on ego. But from I mean, what you've yeah. been doing if you're going to especially if I don't I didn't we didn't ask her age, but. You know, especially you start getting above 30 and stuff like that. If you want to be athletic and play sports like that, I mean, performance is the program for you. I mean, that's the thing. We really tried to kind of cover all aspects of all sports to give general yeah. strength and stability to those well, people. Well, we took the elements, right, of what, you know, creates an athlete, the fundamental principles. You, you need to be able to generate force. You need to be able to control that. You need to be able to, to keep your joints healthy and stable and be able to, you know, in order to move explosively, you need to be able to figure out how to move explosively and also be able to control that. And so completely different pursuits than just generating strength. Yeah. And you, you got to be honest with yourself too. I, I want this thing, yeah. but I don't want to do anything that gets me to this thing. That's what I called her out yeah. on. I'm well, then you want your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Well then you, you don't want it. Like yeah. if you do, right. then you'll do it. Now it's different when I'm doing the things that I think are supposed to help and that nothing's happening, in which case we could look and view and see, okay, well, what's going on? But when the answer's there, they know the answer, they don't want to do it. The question is, do you really do you really want it? And I think the problem is a lot of people want to want something. And so they say it, but your actions speak louder than words. And so it's okay. Look, there's nothing wrong with being a gym fit person and not being able to go play baseball sure. or football with other people. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to be. You have to accept that because uh, being good at certain things requires you do specific things. And if you don't want to do those things, 
then accept then it. Just yeah, you accepted that a long time ago. That's right. I just look. <laughs> I'm just sexy. That's it. There's yeah. nothing else. Sports balls for the birds. That's it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have all kinds of guides that can help you with all fitness and health goals. You can also find us all on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsalen. Adam is at mindpumpadam. 